Hey everyone, Johnny here. Back in June, I did a video about the new Raycast node that showed up in the Blender 3.0 alpha build. But since then, it was replaced with a version that supports fields. Unfortunately, it's not super clear how we do all the things that we did with the old version with the new version. So I wanted to go over the node again so that you could get the most out of it. So let's jump into it. Here we've got a source object and a target object. I'm going to add a node tree to the source object. I'm going to drag the target object into my node tree as well. Next, I'll add a Raycast node. Now I'm using Blender 3.1 Alpha, but the Raycast node did get changed in the Blender 3.0 final release. Some of the functionality works exactly the same as it did before, but now that this is a fields node, it does work a little differently. The first thing I'm going to do is wire up my target object as the target geometry for my Raycast. Now, what you want to think about is that the outputs coming out of this node are field values for this geometry. So our source geometry is going to look backwards for these fields. And the data for these fields is going to be generated by this target geometry. So what does that look like? In this case, our target is to the positive X of our source. So I'm going to adjust my ray direction to have a positive X and nothing on the Z. This means that all my rays will be fired in this direction. A quick way to visualize this will be to add a viewer node. I'll control shift click on the group input and that will hook the viewer geometry up to my group input. Now I'll pull the value off of my Raycast node. In this case, I'll look at the is hit. Let's look up here and see what we get. In my viewer column, I see that four of my vertex values are one and four of them are zero. But since the rays are all going in this direction, they all should be hitting at this point. What's going on with that? Well, the thing we'll want to look at is here on our object info. We've currently got our object set to original position. That means that when this object is being evaluated by this node tree, it's placing it at the center of the node tree. So according to our node tree, the target is actually here. And because of that, the vertices firing rays on this side are hitting, and the ones firing it on this side are not hitting. Going back to our original setup, I'm going to change the object to relative mode. So now it's being offset by the actual position of the target, and you'll see that all of the vertices are now hitting the target. If I move the source up, you'll see as soon as the top vertices go past the top of the target, those values become zero, and the ones that are still even with it are one. One of the primary complaints about the change to fields is the lack of named attributes, and so some feel it makes it more difficult to work with it. In my previous video, I stored the isHit attribute and then used that attribute later in a delete geometry node. Let's see how we would do that here with this one. I'll bring in a delete geometry node and add it to my main geometry. I'm going to take my isHit attribute and put that into the selection. Now we want the geometry to be deleted when it's not hit, and currently it's the opposite. So we'll add a Boolean math node to this pink connection and set it to not. Now if I pull my source back down to the middle, all of the points are hitting and so it's not being deleted. As soon as it goes above the top, it does get deleted. You can see this even more clearly if I subdivide my mesh first. Now if we wanted the position on the target where it's being hit, we could of course use the hit position output and if I control shift click on my Raycast node to change the viewer output, you'll see that my viewer is giving me all of the points where my rays are hitting on the target. If I control shift click again, I get the normal at the position of the hit. If I click again, I get the hit distance. One of the more powerful options of the original Raycast node was the ability to get an attribute from the source. Again, this is where named attributes were very handy. In the previous example, we used a weight paint group on our target as the attribute we wanted to pull. So how do we do that now? 
Currently, if I want to access a vertex group on the object that has a geometry node tree, what I have to do is add an input to my tree. If I click the end panel and go to group and then click the plus sign on inputs, you'll see the input listed here in our modifier. I can give that input a static value if I like, or I can click this button. This is the input attribute toggle button. When I click this, I'll get the option of adding an attribute. These are the existing attributes on this geometry before the geometry node. So if I were to go and to add a vertex group to this, when I go to my modifier, that vertex group is now available as an input and its values are now passed into the node tree. There isn't an immediately obvious way of bringing this target attribute into our node group because it doesn't come in through the group input. It comes in through this object info node, but there's no attribute input for the object info node. Currently, there is a way to do this, although it's not immediately obvious. Here's what we're gonna do. We'll go over to our target object and give it some subdivisions. We'll go into weight paint mode and give it a little bit of value. Now in my targets vertex group, I'm gonna rename this to a unique value. Let's call it something like target group. If we return to our node tree and the modifier panel on our node tree, if we go to this input, we can type in manually the name of the vertex group that exists on our target. It won't show up in this dropdown list because this is only for the node group's object itself, not other ones that it references. So since we called it target group, I'll put in that name here. Now we just need to wire it up correctly. I'll take this input, which is mapped to target group, and bring it in to the attribute side of our Raycast node. So now our Raycast node will be looking for an attribute on our target object called target group. Then it will pass it out through this attribute socket. So we had at the center higher values radiating out. So if I move the source up a little bit, you'll see that the values go down as they get away from the center and vice versa. And they drop to zero when there's no value coming back at all. So let's put all these concepts together and redo the final part of the original Raycast video. So here we have a default cube with a geometry node tree on it. Here is half of a UV sphere, and here's a cylinder that I've turned into an arrow. The first thing we'll do is instance the arrow on the points of the cube. We'll do that using an instance on points node. We'll drag in the arrow, which is this cylinder object, and we'll hook it up to the instances. What we wanted to do was have each arrow cast a ray towards this half sphere, and then have that arrow point in the direction of the normal. So let's go ahead and hook up the normal. We'll do that using the raycast node. We'll need to bring in our UV sphere and set it as the target. Again, we're gonna set the ray direction going in the positive X direction. Now we wanna set the rotation of the instances to be aligned with the normal of our UV sphere. However, the hit normal is a vector and the rotation is a rotation. So to make these work together, we'll use a utilities align Euler to vector node. We'll plug the hit normal into the vector and the rotation into the rotation of the instance on points node. Like in our previous example, we're gonna set the position of our object to relative. Our arrows are all pointed in the wrong direction and the reason for that is that our arrow is aligned to the Z axis. So we're gonna change the axis to align to, to Z. So now our arrows are pointed away from our UV sphere in the direction of the hit normal. Now, we did want them to align pointing towards the UV sphere. So we'll wanna flip the hit normal around. It's really easy to do that. We'll just add a vector math node, set it to scale, and scale it negative one. Let's take this example one step further. We'll go to our UV sphere and go to weight paint, and we'll add some weight to this. In the object data properties panel for our UV sphere, I'm gonna change the vertex group to target group. Back on our node tree, I'm gonna add a group input and plug it in to our attribute for our raycast. 
This will do the job of adding the attribute input for us. Now if I go to my modifier panel, I'll change my attribute and put in target group. For something simple, I'm going to take this attribute and plug it into the scale. Since vertex group data goes from 0 to 1, I do want to bump this up a little bit. So I'll add a utility math node and multiply it by 3. So now if I move my arrows, they still rotate and point in the direction of the hit normal, but now they're also controlled by the vertex group on the target. If for some reason you needed to take these values and send them out your modifier, you'd simply use a capture attribute node. The question is, where would you place this? You want to place this where your field is connecting with your geometry. So here, my geometry comes into the instance on points node, and that's where it's getting its information for rotation and scale from the raycast node. So if we place our capture attribute here, and then connect our attribute here, it's going to be accomplishing the same thing that's happening over here, where our original geometry is now being calculated through this Raycast node. And we can take this attribute and send it out the output. We could give this a name and then say use that in a shader if we really wanted to. So that's it for this one. I hope this clears up the new Raycast node in Blender 3.0 final release and beyond. Thanks for watching the video. I hope this inspires you to make something awesome. So until next time, I'll catch you later.